President Kofuado is under fire for his failure to mention the impact of illegal mining in his COP29 address. And the number of the CSOs and indeed Ghanaians are raising fundamental questions about the president's silence on the impact of illegal mining, at least at the international stage. So if we need help, that can also be given. But President Kofuado yesterday called on world leaders to move beyond rhetoric and take decisive action to address global climate crisis. He spoke at the COP29 in Azerbaijan during the World Climate Leaders Summit, emphasizing the need for effective measures to protect vulnerable communities from the increasing threats posed by climate change. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Nana Adu Danwa Kufu Adu, President of Ghana. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Chairperson, Excellencies, distinguished leaders, Ghana thanks Azerbaijan for her warm welcome and congratulates her for assuming the chairmanship of COP with dedication to our shared future. As I attend COP for the last time as President of the Republic of Ghana. Today we gather not merely as leaders or policy makers, but as individuals bound by our love for our lands and future generations. We're here to declare we stand in solidarity for a green world. For Ghana, climate change is real and immediate, affecting our farmers, coastlines, and communities. Rising temperatures and unpredictable weather threaten our livelihoods daily. Yet we respond with resilience and commitment. In 2021, Ghana submitted updated nationally determined contributions to the United Nations, encompassing 47 programs to mitigate and adapt to climate impacts. Our goal is to cut emissions by 64 million metric tons by 2030, demanding investments between 10 and 15 billion United States dollars. Despite financial and technical hurdles, we're determined to meet the Paris Agreement's goals across agriculture, transport, forestry, energy, and other sectors. We have made strides. The Green Ghana Project has planted 50 million trees, and forest restoration efforts have covered 721,000 hectares since 2017 when I came to office. 13 mitigation actions have cut annual greenhouse gas emissions by 43% since 2021. Ghana's national electric vehicle policy, backed by tax incentives, promotes sustainable mobility, and our energy transition framework steers us towards a green future. Through Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, Ghana has mobilized 800 million United States dollars by trading carbon credits with nations like Switzerland and Sweden. However, we cannot reach our climate goals alone. We call on our global partners to honor their commitments, ensuring accessible concessional financing for sustainable development in Africa without unsustainable debt. As a father and a grandfather, I question what we will leave behind. What world will we leave behind? Our children's future hinges on our decisions. That COP29 here in Azerbaijan mark a pivotal shift from dialogue to decisive action. Let us act boldly, showing future generations that we fought for them. Ghana stands united with the world for a green, resilient tomorrow. That's President Kufuado. Some sound words there, but... While others commend the president for his speech, others are not enthused because he left fundamental issues happening in this country out of that. Let's engage two people. 
uh, one in Azerbaijan who was attending this same conference that the president is attending. Um, the president just spoke there, uh, as you, you saw it yesterday. Deputy Director of Arucha Ghana, Daryl Bosu, is joining us from Azerbaijan. Also, Awula Sewa is uh, the National Coordinator for Eco Conscious, one of the former CSOs in the environment space in this country, is here with me in Ghana. Uh, lady and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Great. And Dara, I'll have you on, on mute for me, but I'll start off with you. I mean, listening to the president, I'm going to just recall the last words of that speech we just played. He says that as a father and a grandfather, he, he, he is worried about the kind of world that he is going to be leaving behind because the decisions of today would impact on the future of his grandchildren and, and the children as well. How does that strike you? Ironica, if you really believe what you were saying, why did he pass EI-144, which declassifies parts of Achimota Forest, knowing very well that Achimota Forest is the last remaining forest reserve in, the, in Accra? Why would he remove the lungs of Accra? He knows very well that if our ancestors had been as greedy as we are, we wouldn't have had anything to come to. And if he cares about his children and grandchildren, why was LI246 to pass? A perverse piece of legislation that allows mining in forest reserves, including globally significant biodiversity areas. If he cares about his children and grandchildren, why is he not taking decisive action against illegal mining? Why did he not agree to the state of emergency to remove um, illegal miners and their equipment from our forest reserves and from our water bodies, knowing that we face an existential threat, that we are being poisoned by the activities of the criminal um, illegal miners. If he cared that much, why is he allowing Akonta mining to walk free when we know that according to the information, they are alleged to have destroyed parts of the Tano Nimiri Forest Reserve and there's been no accountability. If he cares so much about his children and grandchildren and what we are leaving to them, why is it that those that were mentioned in Professor Frimpon Boateng's report are walking free whilst activists, activists are those who are being hounded by the police? I find all this very, very interesting and I don't know who um, he's actually talking to. I see. Well, he, he was talking to the global leaders. You say that this is ironical and, and misrepresentation, essentially? Well, it's also a reflection of the facts that we see. When we look at the images, we look at the loss of forest cover, we look at how most of our water bodies are, <laughs> are polluted and that we are still granting licenses, whether mining, prospective, whatever you call it, to go and destroy our forest reserves. How does this show that we are interesting, interested in preserving the environment? Absolutely not. It just makes us look like very greedy people who are only interested in the wealth they can get from the minerals we have, but not at all um, interested <clears throat> in the consequences. We face an existential threat, rise in kidney disease, rise in cancers, rise in maternal mm. deaths, stillborn babies, deformed, um, you know, babies born with birth defects. And yet, right. yet instead of pausing um, small-scale mining until we get our act together, we are continuing with it. Look at the manifestos of all the political parties. Apart from Alan Tremonte, who has a 10-point plan and talks about pausing or banning community mining or small-scale mining for a while, who is seriously addressing the menace we face? I see. And, and uh, I will ask, stay with me a bit. Let, let's cross over to Azerbaijan now. And Daraboso, Deputy Director of Arocha Ghana, is one of uh, a few CSOs from Ghana in the environment space who are attending this conference as well. Uh, Daryl, appreciate that you could stay to, to connect with us. It's about uh, uh, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. where you are. But hearing the president speak, I'm sure you were in that audience. Now, uh, was that disconnect based on the realities we're faced with? You, you made a very good point. And this is one thing I've also had a very serious issue with, the fact that everything the president said is something you say, an admonition that should go to himself. Because he talked about 
now moving away from dialogue to action. He talked about the fact that as um, elderly, we need to make sure we leave a sustainable future for generations yet to come. But the thing is that once in Ghana, these reflections and all the things he said, is not the way he's he's addressing Galamse. And when we talk about climate change, I mean, there are several drivers of climate change. One that has to do with deforestation and forest degradation, where you lose your forests, which, which have the capacity to help you also um, control and regulate and the heating, the temperatures that are going up. Also ensure that there is sufficient food security so that in the midst of um, insecurity coming from drought and all of that, communities can have access to food and all and, and all of those. But in Ghana, um, we have seen Galamse destroying farmlands, then putting food security at risk. We've seen our water bodies being um, polluted severely to the extent that there are also associated health risks and all of that. These are the things that are driving um, vulnerabilities in Ghana now. So once you start talking about climate change in Ghana, you cannot do that without talking about the menace and the impact Galamse is having on the lives of Ghanaians. And so any leader, any government, any president who thinks that they can talk about climate change and and then and, and then look the other way in terms of actions to address Galamse is missing the mark. And this is where I think that uh, the president has really missed the opportunity to have taken the necessary steps to deal with Galamse. Because once you are not interested in dealing with Galamse, then everything you are saying on the international platform concerning climate change is just a facade. And that is what we have seen him do um, over and over again. He just, I mean, um, always is spot on with the rhetorics, but there is no commitment in addressing one of the major drivers of climate vulnerabilities in Ghana, which is Galamse as it is now. We also need to call our leaders out so far our president is, I mean, like I said, he's an international darling boy. He's always saying all the good things that people want to hear. But coming back home to Ghana, everything he's done in terms of forest, the forest conservation leadership partnership, the Climate Vulnerable Forum. I mean, you know, we, we, we're, we're chairing the Climate Vulnerable Forum. We're also co-chairs of the Forest and Climate Leadership Partnership. All of this was great. But... We have not seen it translate to actions on the ground. And that is where we think that right. CSOs uh, must not relent. They must keep voicing these issues out and make our government accountable and, and also ensure that there's transparency in terms of the disbursements and the actions that government mm. is reporting on the international platform. Because sometimes what we have seen is that the reality that is presented at the international platform through the flurry speeches is very different from the realities of people living in Ghana and mm -hmm. the kind of hassle and the trouble and the risks and the exposure that they are, they are experiencing as a result with. of the unchecked activities of illegal mining and the associated impunity that comes with it. I mean, I couldn't have put it any better than this. Now. And, and I will, I'm going to end with you on this. In, in as much as, yes, you wouldn't expect that you know, the president is going to wash our dirty linen of Galamse on the international front. You, you hear him speak about the existential threat that climate change poses to us, right? Because he made the point that climate change is real and immediate and threatens our livelihoods daily. But that's what Galamse is doing, is it not? Well, you see, it makes him even worse because he knows what's going on. He's aware of the echo side going on. He knows what illegal mining is doing. He knows that the firefighters are actually the arsonists. A lot of them are within the party or supporters of the party. So it's, all, it's one thing not being competent enough to appreciate the problem. But I think it's, it's an indictment where he's very much aware of what is going on. He's very much aware and he's stating it. And yet, he will not do anything to stop it. And I think that's one of the worst things you can do. Be aware of how your people are dying, facing an existential threat. You have the power to do something about it. And you refuse to do something about it because you want your, power, your party to remain in power. <clears throat> I think this is terrible. This is unacceptable. And the international community is, is uh, complicit. Complicit because they have their embassies and high commissions here. So they know exactly what is going on. And yet they hear all these uh, speeches, which they know do not reflect the true facts. And for whatever reason, they choose to go along with this. And I think this is not good for Ghana and it's not good for the um, 
respect we might have for the international community. Mm. Well, I, I do appreciate you on this, and I thank you very much for joining us with your thoughts on this matter. But maybe, and, and, and maybe in 30 seconds, quick one, for you CSOs beyond these talks and so on, well, the organized labor is, is, is off the plate in terms of the pressure. Utah is off. So what next? Aula. To persevere, we need to continue. We face an existential threat. We have been disappointed by organized labor. But that doesn't stop us from reorganizing and seeing what can be done to, shop, to stop their ship from sinking. Because we do face an existential threat. We have been let down by organized labor. But that's not the end of the story. We will regroup. And we will organize ourselves to act and ensure that we save this country from destruction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awala Sewa is uh, National Coordinator for Eco-Conscious Citizens, one of the former CSOs in the environmental space. Daryl Bosso, connecting with us from Azerbaijan. Thank you. Attending COP29 is uh, Deputy National Director of Arocha Ghana. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. And I'm going to show you these videos. Um, this came through from a good friend of ours, Adam Srem. Uh, these are drone videos of the Densu Enclave. This is the area around the Densu River. And you have some parts of the Densu River diverted by these Galamse operators, uh, which we took our eyes off the ball a bit, but there's a lot that's happening. Illegal mining is going on in many places across the country. Fundamental question is, what is the, the latest update in terms of the impact of this latest operations by the military as was commissioned by government to clamp down on illegal mining but this is it this is how the real picture looks like right now and these are drone videos of what is happening within the Densu enclave and you recall that we had reported earlier that the Densu was polluted and that feeds into the wager dam that is also a source of water for Ghana water to distribute to a number of us millions here in the greater Accra region should be concerned about this.